Today we're going to hear God's Word from Hebrews chapter 13. Our church's Bible reading plan this past week had us in the last part of Hebrews, and so I'm going to again be preaching from Hebrews today. Uh, before we look at that passage, I just want to highlight some things about what um, is involved in the context of the Bible as well as the context of our own situation. We're going to read from Hebrews 13, verse 17, this direction, Obey your leaders and submit to them. Obey your leaders and submit to them. If you have that kind of a command and take it out of context, you can go down a lot of very bad paths. And it's very important to hear that type of command in the context of the wider biblical teaching as well as the context in which we live today. Because without the wider biblical context and without thinking about the kinds of situations that we live in, if you just take that one thought, obey your leaders and submit to them, you're very likely to wind up going very badly off the tracks. There are toxic leaders. And if you always obey and submit to toxic leadership, you will end up in a world of trouble. That is true of political leaders, the leaders of a nation, of a state, of a local government. There are leaders who are abusive and cruel and oppressive, who go far beyond their a proper scope of governance and get into all kinds of areas that they really don't have authority to be dictating in. There are leaders who positively support evil. An obvious example would be Hitler's death camps where people were killed and disposed of in the death ovens. In our own society, when leaders are funding the killing of unborn babies, they are doing something very wicked. When they are funding surgeries that change people from what they were created to be to something else, the government is doing wicked things. When a government is under laws that grant freedom of religion and freedom of assembly, and then give orders to churches as to when they can gather and when they can't, and to people when they can assemble and when they can't, then you're dealing with an oppressive government. And that's a different situation than a government that is well within its proper bounds as given by God, and you have to deal with it accordingly. When Daniel was said, nobody prays for 30 days to anybody but the emperor, what did Daniel do? Did he say, well, I am supposed to obey my leaders and submit to them so I won't pray for 30 days? No, he prayed. Because a uh, basic principle of the Bible is we must obey God rather than man. And so you have many examples of disobeying authority in the Bible. If you only read one portion of the Bible, you think, well, that was simple uh, during the last two years, uh, many church leaders read Romans 13, the first few verses. Submit to those who are in authority over you. Well, that's simple. The authorities say don't gather for worship. Um, okay, we're not. Well, that was easy, wasn't it? Well, life's not so easy as taking one little sentence or paragraph out of its context rather than in the wider context of Scripture. Proverbs 28, verse 16 says, A ruler who lacks understanding is a cruel oppressor. There are cruel oppressors, rulers who lack understanding, and we don't have to pretend that they're good rulers. These may be glad tidings, but you don't have to pretend when an oppressor um, is oppressing that he's doing it all for your good. Many times they're not. Uh, take, take examples. Uh, just move a little north of the border for a minute. Some truckers showed up in the capital city of Canada and honked their horns a few times and had some bouncy houses. So, the Prime Minister of Canada invoked the Emergency Act, never before invoked in the history of Canada. It was created only in cases of war and terrorism. And the bouncy houses and the honking horns. Uh, he's shut the country down for two years, 
and two weeks in one city meant the emergency powers must be invoked. That's, are all Canadians say, yes, that is a wise and judicious decision, O oh great and omnipotent ruler. No, he's making bad decisions and we don't have to pretend otherwise. Uh, the Bible says, ah, shepherds of Israel who've been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep. You get people who are in politics, hey, we live, in, we live near to Chicago. People in politics who line their own pockets out of governance. So we need to be aware that in the realm of the nation and of the state and of the city, political leaders can be toxic. And so Christians have to do more than simply listen to one sentence that talks about submitting and obeying. You have to evaluate. You have to think about it. Sometimes you evade or disobey unjust rulers. Sometimes, when you get the chance, you replace them, because this is a nation where we do still get to make our voice heard as citizens and where we get to vote, so um, throw them out. Sometimes, uh, in tough circumstances, you escape. You move to a different state, you move to a different nation. Uh, the, a lot of our forebears are, came here because they were leaving nations under oppressive rulers who were stifling their freedom of worship, the worship of God. So we're actually, a lot of people in this nation have ancestors who came here in the first place to escape toxic national leaders. But unfortunately, it's not just political leaders who can be toxic. Sometimes the leaders of family can be as well. And again, there are those commands in the Bible that are there. Children, obey your parents. Honor your father and your mother. And some parents like to trot those out as though they're the only statements in the Bible. Those statements also come in a context. If you want your kids to honor you, be honorable. If you want them to obey you, give orders that are worth following. And in the context of encouragement and love, not just order after order after order. When the Bible says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, it also says, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Don't drive your kids crazy. Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. When it says, a wives, submit to your husbands, it also says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them, it says in another place. So every time we read about obedience or submission, we have to take the fuller teaching of the scripture into account. And we also have to take into account the fact that the Bible doesn't just say obey and honor your parents. Sometimes it says, don't follow your parents. You say, oh, boy, I'm getting out of here. I don't want, a, I don't want a church where the preacher says don't honor your parents and don't obey them. Well, try these statements on for size. Do not walk in the statutes of your fathers, nor keep their rules, nor defile yourself with their idols. Do not be like your fathers. They did not hear or pay attention to me. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. You were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. Those statements are in the Bible too. Not just children obey your parents. But there's obviously some evaluating that goes on. And especially as you get older, you have to evaluate some things. People use the word deconstruction nowadays. When I was a little younger, we studied deconstruction as a theory of philosophy where words really don't mean anything and you can just change it to say there's no objective truth or whatever. Sometimes the word is still used that way. But nowadays, sometimes deconstruction refers to as uh, people get a little older, they evaluate. They decide, well, how much of this religion that I was handed is actually true? How much of what my parents said and did is actually right? And that's a little threat, that's a little scary if you're the one having those thoughts, and it's a little offensive if you're the parents whose practices and character are being evaluated. But really, to say deconstruction is always bad, you shouldn't think these things through, well, that is simply to take this one command in the Bible, uh, submit to your leaders who are over you in the Lord, as the only thing the Bible says. The Bible says more than that. And so, 
when you've been brought up in a family, there comes a point at which you say, now, how much of what my family handed down to me is something that I could, should continue? How much of what my church taught me is something I should continue to believe? We have to ask those questions and not pr just pretend that the questioning is always wrong. When the Bible says to wives to submit to their husbands, let, let's just consider a couple of cases in point. Uh, Abigail in the Old Testament had a husband named Nabal. His name means fool. And he lived up to it or down to it. So he takes action which, unless something happens really soon, her whole family is going to get wiped out because he has offended David in a terrible way. And so Abigail just ignores what Nabal was up to and, just and goes to David and tries to make things right. Or take, and she, and she rescues her whole family from getting killed, except Nabal, whom God kills. Or you have Queen Esther. Her husband is the emperor of Persia, Xerxes. And so as emperor, he has absolute authority. And so when you're a citizen under the emperor, you should submit, right? And when you're married to the guy and he's your husband, well, you're the wifey, you should submit, right? So her husband issues an edict. And what does she do? She tries to figure out how to undo that boneheaded edict of her husband because if she doesn't, she and all the Jewish people would be killed. So there are circumstances. There are circumstances where a wife says, I'm sorry, but my husband is out to lunch. We got to do something different here to fix the situation. And so when you're in a situation where there's a, a father or a mother, a parent who is extremely controlling or harsh or abusive or unreasonable or required all sorts of things that were harmful to you, you are not simply to pretend that all was well. You don't pretend that abusers are wonderful. Sometimes you have to resist unjust demands. Sometimes you have to separate yourself from that situation. That's true for some wives. It's true for some kids. And it's very hard to sort out. Because when you're a Christian, you want to honor your father and your mother. If you grew up with one who's abusive, what do you do with that? Sometimes honor involves boundaries. Sometimes it involves where there's no situation of repentance or change. It involves Staying apart from them until there is evidence of repentance. So in the family, the command to submit is a command that you have to take in the wider context of Scripture and look really hard at your own context and situation to see how it applies. This is also true of church leadership. If you doubt that church leadership can be toxic, just one itty-bitty little question. Who killed Jesus? The one who made the final decision and ordered it was the high priest of Israel. The number one religious figure in God's chosen people. And Jesus himself warned against uh, false rabbis and Pharisees. He said, hey, if you're following a blind guide, they're going to fall into a pit, and you're going to fall into it right along with them. There are people who will cross land and sea to win a convert and make him into twice the son of hell that they are. You don't want to follow religious leaders who are turning you into a son of hell or a daughter of hell. Jesus would not say such things if you could just automatically say, yeah, uh, pastors, elders, deacons, they've got it together. They, they are always wise and worthy of submission. And so uh, we need to beware of toxic leadership in the nation, in the family, in the church. And having said all that, the Bible still does have these statements um, to submit to those who are over you in the Lord. And that does mean that under ordinary circumstances, when there are the leaders of a nation who are doing their job, or at least a fair approximation of it, you ought to honor that kind of leadership and be glad that they're there, even if they're not perfect. Even if you would have preferred somebody else, but overall, if they're doing a half-decent job, you're glad that you're not living in a situation of anarchy where 
the whole nation is messed up. And as you do that, you can also say our nation is more than just who happens to hold power right now. When you're part of a nation with a heritage, you focus on the great leaders in that heritage as well and the great documents in that heritage. In our own nation, you have a declaration of independence which recognizes that God, our creator, gave us certain unalienable rights. We have a constitution which defines and limits the borders of government power and defines some of those rights. We have some heroes, and they're, they weren't perfect heroes. But you might not want to tear all their statues down because the ones who are trying to replace them are not exactly heroic. This is true in the life of a nation. And so it's not just the recent mandates of tyrants that you submit to. You look at what is the overall context of law in a nation, of the good laws, of the heritage that came down, and you try to improve on that heritage. You don't just chuck it all, because we've had those who try to chuck their entire heritage. The leading example probably is the French Revolution. They were going to restart the calendar. The calendar restarts with the revolution. Everything restarts, and we chop off everybody's head that we disagree with. And eventually the revolutionaries themselves, Robespierre himself, got his head lopped off. This is how it goes when you say we're going to just reject everything and, and toss it all. The, in the family, we can honor those. And many of us were blessed with families that have given so much good to us. We have a heritage of generations that was passed down to us and we should treasure that and value that. And where, we're, where we have a family, where you have a husband or a wife who really strengthens and empowers you, where you have parents who are just helping you and, and shaping you in wonderful ways, well, then be glad for them, honor them. And for those of us who want to be leaders worth following, um, if you're a parent, here's a simple word of advice. You can read lots of different books on parenting and all this, but become the kind of person you want your kids to be. That's your number one guideline on parenting. Become the person you wish your kids would become. Because that's very likely the path that you'll be nudging them down. And when it comes to the church, God gives church leaders, he's given us a, a great heritage in the church. In Hebrews, you read about the heroes of faith, just uh, shortly before the chapter we're going to look at. There's the heroes of faith, one after another after another, and you look at those heroes, and you thank God for the generations who came before us, and the heroes of church history. And you thank God for uh, pastors and elders and deacons who led the church in a godly way. And, and so to help God's people become God-centered and God-loving, God appoints leaders. And when it speaks of leaders, it can involve elders, um, deacons, pastors. It can involve those of us who are involved in parenting. It can involve any of us who have influence on others in any way, even if we don't hold a title of office. Uh, one example that I'll take is uh, women who lead in the church. Our church has men as elders. And the Bible um, calls for men to be elders. But it also says, now I want the older women to teach the younger women. I want uh, those who are widows. There was a whole order of widows described in Timothy where godly widows were having a powerful impact in the church. And, and even when it speaks of elders, it talks about the elders' wives because you know what? It's teamwork. If you were to uh, ignore the Bible for just a moment and look at our own church, you know, we have some men who are elders. And then I look at their wives, and they're always praying with some woman. <laughs> you know, they're always getting together and helping and mentoring women because they, they function in a way as elders towards women. And they bring that office of elder to bear in the lives of many women. And so we can be thankful that God gives different kinds of people different um, opportunities for leadership, and when God puts somebody in your life that has a positive impact and sets a positive example, then we hear what Hebrews is saying about honoring and submitting 
to godly leadership. And so that's what we want to focus on. This passage from Hebrews 13 focuses mainly on church leaders and about the impact that they have on God's people. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace and not by ceremonial foods. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. When we think about leaders worth following, there's two main areas to think about. What that one is what leaders ought to be like. What should leaders be? And then how should um, the rest of us respond to those who are in leadership? So there's words for leaders and also direction for a congregation. And the first thing he says is, you know, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. A leader in the church is somebody who doesn't just have a lot of clever ideas or personal insights. It's fine if somebody is clever and insightful, but a leader in the church knows God's word and speaks God's word to you. And you Pay attention to people if they speak God's word. If you have somebody who just happens to have a high IQ and uh, the gift of gab and the ability to attract a crowd, but they're not speaking God's word, uh, run. But honor those who speak God's word because it's not human opinion, but the scriptures, the word of God, revealing Jesus Christ, the incarnate word of God, that's what leaders in Christ's church are meant to convey, the Word of God. Secondly, leaders worth following live a fruitful life. It says, consider the outcome of their way of life. You want leaders that you want other people to become like. You want leaders whose lives are reproducible. You want the outcome of their way of life to be what you see as the fruit of their life. They live a fruitful life. When you read other passages about church leadership, one of the things they look at is, okay, what's their family like? How is their wife doing? How are their children doing? If they can't lead their own household, how can they lead the church of God, is the question Paul asks in that context. What's, what's the outcome of their way of life on the people who are closest to them? And then, what is the outcome of their way of life leading to eternal life? Is it, is it bearing fruit? Are others being led to the Lord? But more importantly, are they on that narrow path that leads to life? Or are they just strolling down that broad road to destruction and saying how inclusive they are because they've got a lot of other people on the broad road with them? They live a fruitful life, which bears good fruit closest in the people closest to them, and they're walking the path to eternal life. And don't, don't let somebody's abilities make you follow them in and of itself. It's important for people to have gifts of leadership and ability, but there are people with ability who do not have the fruitful life that you want replicated in the lives of individuals and of families. Another thing that leaders worth following do is they model faith. They have a faith worth imitating. Hebrews says, imitate their faith. And he's just finished telling us about all those heroes of faith uh, who trusted God in challenging times and did great exploits through God or suffered martyrdom for the sake of God and they were looking to the city with foundations whose builder and maker is God. But they were people of faith. They trusted the unseen God. Moses saw him who is unseen, as Hebrews puts it. Somehow he 
encountered the invisible God, and he counted all the treasures of Egypt as worth nothing compared to suffering for Christ. And you get all kinds of examples like that. But they, they were people of faith who trusted in God, and as Hebrews puts it, without faith it's impossible to please God because you've got to believe that he's real and that he rewards those who seek him. He's real and he rewards those. So you look to God and you look to the reward. And that's what faith is. And you have leaders who trust God, who see him who is unseen, who live for the city with foundations, that eternal city whose architect and builder is God. They model faith, not just unbelief and doubt. Nowadays, it's kind of trendy. It is kind of trendy to have the leader go scuffling along and say, well, I'm really not sure this, and I'm not really sure that. And, you know, we are all questioning. Questioning is kind of a wonderful thing, and doubt is really a productive thing. And at some point, you might want to say, I kind of like a leader with a little faith, because I'm pretty good at doubting all by myself. <laughs> Uh, you know, we all, you know, again, I'm not saying we shouldn't uh, help each other with our struggles or deny that we have our struggles. But at some point, we want to have people who step with the Lord in faith. And above all, they are leaders who connect with Jesus Christ and help you to connect with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And one of the dangers in leadership is that you get your own little kingdom going. And you get something going where people are really attracted to you and think you're really quite some hot shot. When in fact, the, your only purpose as a leader in a church is to help people know Jesus Christ better. And the only leaders worth following are those who know Christ and make him known and help you to know him. And keep in mind what Hebrews says. He isn't reinvented every five minutes. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. Forever the second person of the Trinity. Forever the same character, the same holy Jesus Christ, the same high priest who meets our need. And so people who are trying to jazz up Jesus and make him really spiffy and, and acceptable to you and so on, be really careful because maybe they're messing with the real Jesus. Maybe they're adapting the real Jesus, to be more marketable. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. And we need to connect with him, those, whether you're a leader, whether you are looking to other leaders, to connect with Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's the only point of the church. That's the only point of church leadership. And then you need leaders who resist strange ideas. And there are a lot of strange ideas floating around. And we need to have help resisting them. Hebrews says, do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. That's what it says in verse 9. And then in verse 17, it says of the leaders, they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. So there's these diverse and strange teachings, and there are watchmen on the walls. One of the great tragedies of much church leadership is that they have begun to treat their job as being an organizational functionary and a patter of heads and a soother of feelings. They run an organization and they try to make people feel better. And there is, of course, an organizational element to leadership. And there is the tenderness of a shepherd with people who are wounded and a spirit of kindness and of helping them along. But there is also the watchman calling, the prophetic calling. I have made you watchmen on the walls. In Ezekiel, God says to the prophet, I appointed you a watchman and you had better warn people of the bad stuff because if you don't, their blood will be on your head. If you warn them and they just ignore you, well, they will perish, but at least their blood won't be on your head. Those are pretty sober warnings. And somebody who claims spiritual leadership but has never heard those warnings of what it means to be a leader and a watchman among God's people had better 
get acquainted with those messages in a hurry. Because if you read the scriptures, the true leaders of God's people were not the ones who said, peace, peace, when there is no peace. They were not the ones who just kind of ran the organization. They gave warnings from God against false teachings, false prophecy, false gods. And so if you want a leader worth following, find those who are going to help you resist the strange ideas, not the ones who tickle or scratch itching ears. The Bible says that, that there's going to be a time when people will want their ears tickled, but you preach the word in season and out of season, when it's popular and when it's not, when people like it and when they don't. That's, that's the only time you have to preach the word is when it's popular or when it's not. And then, of course, there is, along with that, um, combative element of leadership, and I, I don't apologize for that word. You need to have a few combative bones in your body. You better have a backbone. You better have a sword if you want to lead God's people. But you also need to keep this in mind. Um, you need to strengthen people with grace. Chapter 13, verse 9 says, It is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. If it's all about the Word of God, and if it's all about Jesus, then it is, in the end, all about grace. Even the backbone and the sword are in the defense of grace. And to make sure grace, and not some phony baloney counterfeit, is what people are being fed. The true grace of God, the grace of God in giving His Son, the grace of God in seeing our sins as they are, and choosing to wash them away and forgive them, despite how much they offend His holiness because he's the God of all grace. And he gives us that grace through the new covenant in Jesus Christ, not through a whole bunch of additional rules and regulations. Hebrews emphasizes that again and again, that it's not through following this or that ritual. The blood of bulls and calves, that's not going to wash you clean. It's the blood of Christ. It's not all the other stuff. It's Jesus Christ and his grace. And so leadership is proclaiming God's grace and then showing daily grace to people who are struggling. God gives us daily grace to help us in our time of need. Bad leadership is sometimes very good at heaping up requirements. And you get tired just being around such leaders. They have a gazillion and one things for you to do, 87 different programs for you to get into. They, they can... Wear you out, you know, and sometimes it's good leaders, um, you know, I mean, we all have this or that uh, failing where we're not going to be perfect. I know that. But listen to Jesus. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Do you receive grace and rest and refreshment and energizing from leaders? That's an important question. It's kind of a threatening one to mention as a leader because people say, no, I get tired around you and I feel like my batteries are drained. Well, if that's the case, uh, sorry, but that does mean either I'm failing or, or something's not getting through because people are strengthened with grace when you're hanging out with the kind of leaders that God appointed for you and they're functioning in the way that God intended them to. When you have that kind of domineering and abusive and controlling leadership, you're no longer strengthened by grace. You're intimidated and you're pushed. And one requirement after another after another is forced upon you. When you sense that you are loved, that you're welcomed, that you're strengthened and energized, then it's likely that something healthy is going on. So those are some of the hallmarks of leaders worth following. Speaking God's word, living a fruitful life, modeling real faith and belief and confidence in the Lord and his promises, connecting with Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, resisting the strange ideas that are always floating around, and being strengthened with grace. And those of us who are in positions of leadership, whether that is as a pastor or an elder or a deacon or an older woman in the faith mentoring younger women or a parent mentoring children or just whatever sphere of influence you have, seek to 
have an influence worth having. Seek to be a leader worth following. And this is some excellent guidance from God's Word in Hebrews 13 for doing that. And as a congregation, how do we respond to leadership when it's in tune with God's leading for leadership? Well, I want to mention four things. Honor, imitate, obey, pray. Honor. Hebrews says, remember those who spoke the word of God. You don't forget them. You remember them. You honor those who are indeed leading in an honorable way. And so you pay attention to them. And you pay attention to that cloud of witnesses. Hebrews reminds you now, you're going through a tough time. Well, people have been around before you. And they faced some big challenges. And they faced them by faith. And they prevailed. And now you're in the arena. And you're surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses. Get familiar with your Bible. Get familiar with church history and the biographies of some of the great Christians. And let them strengthen you. And when you honor them, it's going to have an impact on you. When you live in ignorance of those great heroes, you're not fed by their faith. You're not inspired by their example. You're not encouraged by the fact that they're in the stands and you're now in the arena. You'll, you'll be out of the arena soon enough in the city with foundations whose builder and maker is God if you walk by faith. So walk by faith. But right now you're in the arena. And honor and remember the heroes and it will help you a bunch. In fact, don't just honor them and say, those were some wonderful people. Imitate them. Have faith like those heroes. Be faithful like those heroes. And above all, you know, it says, we're surrounded by a great host of witnesses, so let's fix our eyes on, not all those heroes even, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy sat before him, endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So, when you're imitating, you imitate godly people whom God has put in your life, you imitate some of those heroes of faith that you've read about, but always you're imitating Christ in them to the degree that Christ is in them. And there is something in the life of nearly everyone that is not worthy of imitation, so don't. But when you see the real, living, dynamic life of Christ at work in, in your leaders, then imitate that. And as you imitate that, you become more and more worthy of imitation yourself. And your influence becomes a leadership blessing for other people. Obey. Do what they say. They're seeking the good of your soul. That's what Hebrews says. They're standing watch over your souls. And if they're faithful to the Lord, then when they are trying to give you guidance and instruction, follow it. And that's one reason why it's so dangerous to have one leader. Because we all have our failings. And so in the structure of our church and in the biblical structure of the church, you have more than one leader. You have uh, more than one person preaching. You have more than one person serving as an elder and leading in congregational prayer. You have more than one person handling the money and being a, the deacon in charge of stewardship. They count money together. They make decisions how to handle that money together. Because... In order uh, to be worth obeying, we need checks and balances on each other, and we want to have a body of leadership, not just one person. And the, the history of the church is full of the wreckage of people who claim to be the one representative of Christ on earth, or the one representative, you know, if they, there are people who don't like popes very much, and then they become the pope of their congregation. I am the Lord's anointed. And when I have a sense of where God is leading, the rest of the congregation says, yes, sir. That's simple. Well, that's not the Bible's design. They always appointed multiple elders, multiple deacons in the church as the New Testament um, faith spread. So we need, we need that plurality. We need accountability. I know the word obey isn't very popular these days, um, accountability. That's one reason why people attend church and don't belong to it. They don't want to answer to anybody. Perish the thought that I would actually submit to or obey any kind of authority. But 
in our own lives, we need that. Um, kids do need parents. Even though not all parents are perfect, kids need them. Churches do need leaders. Congregations do need elders and deacons. We just do. And so we need to have accountability, but always keep in mind what I said earlier. To be given authority or a leadership position does not mean that you are beyond the possibility of sin or above questioning. One of the sure signs of a leader who's going toxic is that you can't talk with them. If you're a parent and your kids can't even talk to you and your only answer at all stages of a child's development is, because I said so. You know, that might be what you need when you're in a hurry to get out the door and do something. You know, you're not going to have an extended discussion every time your kid objects to something. But if you never listen, if you never take into account their questions and the things that they're wondering about or struggling with, then you're soon going to lapse into an authoritarian, controlling style of parenting. And that's very true of church life as well. If everything is treated as though it's beyond discussion, as though you can't interact or ask questions or have a different opinion on certain matters, then that's a sign of controlling and abusive leadership. You need to have leaders that are available, that you can interact with, that you can question, that you can sometimes challenge. So honor, imitate, obey, but obey means obey what, with readiness to interact. In all these relationships too, a parent-child relationship is different than a husband-wife relationship, is different than a elder-congregant relationship. These are all different. And when you're dealing with adults, treat them as adults. When you're dealing with kids, treat them still as people made in the image of God, not just little things for you to manipulate. If you want people to respect you as a leader, you've got to respect them as a person. Otherwise, your leadership becomes abusive. Well, having said all that, the final thing is the author to Hebrew says, now pray for us. Leaders need prayer. They need to be people of prayer, of course, themselves, but also pray for those who are in leadership over you because they have a challenging calling, and so ask God to help them to be holy, to be wise, to be honorable, to be discerning, because it's not always easy. It, to get back to the example where we started the message. What are the elders supposed to do when there's some epidemic going around and you're, you hear that people are dying and the government says, hey, everybody shut down? Do you, you just say, well, that's all a bunch of baloney. Well, it's not so easy in the real world. We decide to gather, and if five of us had died of that epidemic, we'd have felt pretty bad about what happened. It didn't, and we thank God for that. And, you know, we, we were shut down for a few weeks till we kind of got the clue that, hey, yeah, we, we, we've got a better sense now what this thing is and what it isn't. Uh, but, but there's a lot of examples I could give where it's not just clear-cut and obvious what the right path is. And we need to give a lot of grace to leaders and to churches who took a little different path and where uh, it ended up in some great difficulty. But, but pray. Pray that God will give wisdom and, and help us to discern what we need to do as leaders and that God will just give power because in leadership you're fending off all those things but you're leading people to Christ and you're seeking to shepherd people's eternal souls. And for that you need spiritual power so that you don't burn out. You need power and anointing upon what you do and the Spirit's work in people's hearts because unless the Spirit works in the hearts of the congregation, the work of the leaders is useless. Prayer is the key to revival. Prayer is the key to God's work through leaders and in all of our lives. Charles Spurgeon, I think it was, was once asked, um, what is the key to the impact of your congregation and its ministry? What's the key to that? And Spurgeon was called the prince of preachers. He was a tremendously gifted and powerful preacher. So you might, you know, people who looked at it might have thought, yeah, it's because he is such a preacher. Spurgeon, when he was asked what is the key, said, my people pray. That's it. My people pray.
We pray, Father, that you will help each of us to hear your word in the way we need to hear it. Those of us who are in leadership help us to know where we need to change, where we need to do better and get away from wrong patterns of leadership. And we pray, Father, that you will help many in our congregation who have been scarred or wounded by, by bad or toxic leadership at a family level, parents who treated them or talked to them in a certain way that still has a negative impact on them today. We pray, Lord, that you will heal and help them. Those, Lord, who were wounded by bad leadership in church, who were maybe misled or mistaught or simply mistreated by controlling and cruel or abusive and exploitative leaders. We pray, Lord, that you will help and heal those who have endured such wounds and still bring them to you, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, no matter what the failings or strengths of leaders may be. And we do pray too, Lord, for those who have been or are still under the boot of tyranny, of oppressive political rulers. We pray, Lord, that you will break the power of such leaders, that you will remove them from their positions of influence and power, and that you will bring those who bring the well-being of people and, and are wise in what will be good for their people and who rule justly and rightly. And so, Lord, we commit to you, those in leadership, uh, and ask that you will give all of us your wisdom and guidance. We commit to you, all of us who um, need the healthy influence of others and help us to be discerning and to receive gladly the good influence from those who you place in positions of leadership. We thank you, Lord, for those in our own congregation who have been willing to serve your people as elders, as deacons, as leaders of various prayer groups, or um, simply in mentoring people one by one. We thank you for those who believe in home discipleship, who are leaders in their families, for dads and moms who aren't just going to leave it all to somebody else, but who themselves are going to be reading the scriptures with their own children in their own house who are going to be praying together and worshiping you together, not just here in this hour of worship, but during the week with their own children, that they may be leaders worth following for those in their household. We pray, Lord, that all of us, single or married, and whatever our situation in life, may exert an influence that comes from your Holy Spirit, that comes from our Lord Jesus Christ, that comes from you, our loving Father, and that it invites others to delight in the reality and wonder and grace and love of the Trinity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.